lately has put to rest this myth that politicians are bloodless. <laughs> he, he, totally. He, totally. He cut his lip this morning shaving. He just kind of like the uh, old faithful spouting blood everywhere. So I'm trying to stay as far away from him as I possibly can. Yeah, I was, ta- I was Mike, talking. Why are you talking, shaving your I lips? I was talking back to Jason, and uh, he, he popped me in the mouth this morning. That'll happen. Also, Maria Lawrenson. Good morning, Maria. I can't even compete. No. How are you going to do that? I mean, Hey, um, we also have uh, Senator Jason Barrett, who has dutifully remained quiet until being introduced, playing by the rules. Good morning, Jason. Well, you know, I do understand and respect the rules, but at the same (laughs) time, I don't own the place. (laughs) (laughs) Totally true. So, uh, Colin has uh, Knuckles Knowles, our mayor, who will be a prominent part of the home show uh, this weekend, and his first pitch. Do we have the entire video or just the still, Colin? If you have the still, we have the mayor of Martinsburg, Kevin Kevin Knowles. this is pretty amazing. New P.O. Well, the only thing I... Yesterday, and he's going he's gonna to go high and tight on a lefty batter here. Ready? Ooh, brush him back. Nice job, Knuckles. You, you know, the mayor really thinks he's proud. He, he's really proud of that. I mean, he couldn't even do it from the mound. He had to come up 15 feet. <laughs> well, that's the thing, though. You're not allowed to throw the first pitch from the mound. Why not? You have to do it from the grass. Well, he should have done it behind the mound. <laughs> you think he went in front of it? Ma- you wanted to be even manlier. Huh? I got to yeah. give him credit. That's pretty impressive. I'm um, surprised he got it there, to be honest with you. I expected it down in the dirt. <laughs> I mean, he, wore, he, he was he, nervous about that. Yeah. He warmed up over it. Oh, well, well, he I, didn't know I, about it until yeah. like until, what, until he got yeah. on here. Yeah. Yeah. He he's an older man. Yeah, so. I was going to say, be nice to him. He's an older man. I bet he's at the doctor today. Yeah, getting his arm Yeah. Tommy John surgery, yeah, exactly. maybe. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Kevin. You did a good job there, buddy. <laughs> but don't get much sympathy here, though. Not Kevin. at all. You don't get any. But the, the two people to my left also helped contribute to that field to make it what it is today, Jason. Yeah, uh, so I put um, some of my LIDA request money. LIDA is Local Economic Development. I forget what the A is for. Uh, administration, whatever it is. Uh, so each legislator gets uh, a certain amount of money to be able to uh to help out things in the community and i use part of my lead of money uh, as a member of the house actually um to help turf the field and mr hornby yes same thing um trip trip approached me uh told me who was involved and what they needed and uh, it was a no-brainer for me it's it's in my district uh jason's old district uh it made sense yeah. so very proud to be a part of that what do you think about how you used to be the House representative for your district, and now this guy succeeds you? Wow. He handpicked me, right? <laughs> well, now you're getting a little carried away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will tell you, um, Mike has done, uh, all jokes aside, uh, Mike has done a, a really good job in the House, and, and so is Mike Height. I've been uh, impressed with both of them. Um, I, you know, it wasn't easy for me to, to really follow everything that went on uh, in the House throughout the session, but, but I did talk to those guys uh, regularly, and um, you know, they were uh, very much involved and, and active in, in uh, what was going on in the House and within that caucus. Uh, as the assistant caucus chair in the Senate, um, that periodically I would go visit the House caucus, the Republican caucus, uh, and listen in to, um, you know, to what they were talking about, what was important to them, and, and then take that information back to the Senate caucus. So uh, I was impressed with both of them. They, they both had a really good uh, first session. And let me just, uh, again, thank both of you for your Wednesdays during the course of the session. I don't think we missed any Wednesdays with you guys. You you kept, you kept us in tune with the Senate and Mike uh, every Wednesday with the House. Thank you. I, I enjoyed being on and I really, uh, Jason's leadership, having that, that relationship with somebody beforehand really helped. And we, we do have a really large group from the Eastern Panhandle so you can really kind of keep informed with what's going on and what's important. Bill, I know you're sitting on a one-liner over there. Are you ready to spring? <laughs> no, no, but I do want to echo what you said, and actually what both of you said. Uh, I uh, I think you had added a great deal to the uh, – during the session, your insight, what was going on in both the House and the Senate. And, uh, and Jason, I think you're exactly right. From my percepti- perception, uh, both uh, both of Mike's, uh, Hornby and Height, did a very nice job. But let me add one thing to this, Rob. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm Here goes to, the end yeah, of the congratulations. No, no, no. It's actually more – it's shifting the congratulations more to Rob. Uh, <laughs> now, this is the way we should have begun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I, I look at the issue – issues that that are presented to your listening audience every day uh and we covered the session about as well as i think it could be covered with a lot of the legislators we cover other issues as well we talk frequently about the 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 absence of good good coverage good issue coverage 
not only in the state but everywhere with the demise of the local newspaper. I sincerely believe this, that you have made up quite a bit of that vacuum by giving our listeners a broad exposure to a lot of different issues. And these two gentlemen are part of that, but they're not the only ones. There are a lot of folks who do the same thing. Let's not be too nice to him, Bill. Well, no, I was actually being nice. Bill, I want to thank you, and here's the payment that I promised you for doing that. That's right. I was actually being nice to you in a very yeah. convoluted way, no, Mike. I, and I that like was, it. That was a problem. I like it. I like it. Okay. All right, let's, let's tackle some issues here, and let's uh, begin first, uh, because, as you know, we have an active Facebook commenting community, and uh, to say that they are a cynical bunch would be an understatement, because they, they are always looking for something below the surface. And a lot of times they're right about things, too. So uh, you can't dismiss some more just than because some are, some are cynical doesn't mean that they are wrong. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean everybody's not against you, right? <laughs> As they say. But there are some things on there, Jason, that uh, I know on occasion you will see and say that's actually a misperception. Mike, same with you, too. Let's start with the pay raise. You guys voted yourselves a big pay raise. I don't know that we voted ourselves a big pay raise. Uh, that What the House sent over, or I'm sorry, what the Senate sent over uh, was a... Uh, right, right now the salary is twenty thousand dollars, and what the Legislative Pay Commission—I uh, think that's the title—there's uh, a commission that that makes a recommendation to the legislature. We we can't go in and just raise our salaries to whatever we want. There, there's a commission made up of citizens. I, I don't r recall who's on it currently, uh, but they make a recommendation, and their recommendation was uh, to take our salary from twenty thousand dollars a year to uh, the per cap per capita income uh, for a West Virginian. And I believe what I've been told is that number somewhere around twenty eight thousand uh, dollars. And if that goes up, our salary goes up. If th their per capita income for a West Virginia goes down, our salary goes down. Um, what the House did was send back uh, a couple. First, they sent back um, a pay raise. I forget what it was. Uh, Mike, I Mike think it was a thousand dollars. Is the first well, that's what we, we sent back. I know we had negotiated before, and this uh, this. Commission only comes every 10 years, I believe is what it is. So this was the, the opportunity if we were going to do something, we would do it. We weren't giving ourselves a pay raise. We became future legislators. A pay raise. None of us are, are elected, um, especially in the House for 2025 yet. Um, so I, I believe there was, some, there was some back and forth between the House and Senate, but the actual bill we sent back was $1,000, which... Yeah, and it's 75% of the per capita. 75 So it... it equates to a thousand dollars at this point mm -hmm. now they raised they did raise the per diem a little bit they did raise the the daily rate in which we get if we're there for interims or a special session or something like that right so, so. if you don't know the, the pay doesn't cover your cost of living in charleston especially if you're from the eastern panhandle and you've got to get a place to stay while you're down there pay it, that's it, where the per diem comes in right. yeah it, it, it still costs you money to to be down there mm -hmm. let's be honest it, it's it's uh it costs a significant amount of money to live. So when we talk about a citizen legislature, um, while that's true, um, you know, not everybody can even jump in and run. Because when you look at, first off, taking, and you say three months, it's not three months, away from your job because there are interims, there are special sessions, there are... Constituent needs during the year. Exactly. Right. And um, it is... It, it is a pretty abysmal number, and, and one thousand dollars more is not going to no. make for a big. Change. And I think you make a good point, Maria, because I, that was my argument when the Senate sent over. I thought it was really pretty accurate. If if you want a regular person from anywhere else in the state or from the Eastern Panel to be running for this position, you need to compensate them. And, and a regular person in a regular job would not be able to afford this this position. So, which is why you see a bunch of lawyers and uh, business owners. Now. The, import, the important thing for me was that we, and 75%, 100%, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter to me. Right. It, it's more about this is going to be what the salary is moving forward. The legislature now does not have to come back in and give a pay raise. This, this 75% of the per capita, can just stay the way it is uh, indefinitely as far as I'm concerned because if, again, if, if if the state does well, people of West Virginia are doing well, their salaries are going up, the legislative pay will follow that. If they're not doing well and their salaries go down, 
then that's ultimately on the legislature uh, to improve the economy of West Virginia, and they deserve a, a penalty for that too if, if uh, the people of West Virginia aren't succeeding. So this way I think that we don't have to come back and give pay raises uh, for legislators ever, in my view. Now, the per diem and the, you know, th that could be an issue as the hotel rates and those type of things continue to go up. Um, you know, that, that would have to be addressed. But And uh, what did the per diem go from to what rate, Jason? 131 you know to 175. Okay. We're focused on the monetary aspect, and that's certainly important, but there's also a personal, uh, uh, personal loss that you, or sacrifice you folks make. Now, in your case, Jason, you took your family with you. A lot of folks do not have that capability. So there's family separation. That's, yeah, uh, and it's something that we all choose yeah. to do. And, and I'm not asking anybody to feel sorry for any of us. Um, you know, I, I think to, to Mike and Maria's point is that, um, you know, it's not a two or three month job. Uh, there are the people that could, it's not enough to, to live on at $20,000. So. Um, the, the folks that are able to run are, are people that work for themselves, somebody that's retired, or somebody that has the most understanding employer there is to allow you to, to go away for 60 days at a time. Who knows when you'll have a special session. Um, interims can be, you know, at different times. So, um, you know, if you want, uh, you know, regular West Virginians to be able to run for office, people that, that get up and go to work every day, um, you know, you have to be able to, to, to pay them a little more. And so, uh, again, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to me what it is. I, I'm more focused on th that it's taken out of the legislature's hand in the future. Uh, and and I, I've read some of the comments on the on the Facebook page about, um, you know, it's a sixty, it's a twenty thousand dollars for sixty days worth of work. Well, if any legislator is doing sixty days worth of work, they're not doing the job right. Uh, I, I would invite them to answer my emails and my text messages and phone calls for a week and then let me know if it's a 60 day job. I think Larry so when, Kump, Delegate Kump told us he spends anywhere from four to six hours a day, uh, every day, doing constituent services stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. On a regular week, what would you guys, when you're not there, what would you say is the time that you spend in a regular week, not oh, in session? It, it's a. It, for me, it's a, it's a few hours a day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm going to be careful about how much information I put out here. But I, recently, I've had a constituent come out that's having a, a problem with his son, uh, and he needs help, and you know, so it, it's a it's a difficult um, uh, thing for him to navigate. The process is difficult for him to navigate to get a hold of you know the right people and try to get help for his son, and so. You know, I, I look at it as my job as a legislator to put him in contact with the people that are able to help uh, make phone calls to various agencies to get the right person. And and so that I mean, that takes a lot of time to do that. And, sure. and, and that's what I signed up to do. And I'm not complaining about it. But I think people need to understand um, that it's not just what you see on television uh, uh, or on a Facebook feed for 60 days. There, there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes and there's a lot of constituent work that people just don't realize we do. All right. And uh, let's uh, get to another one, which is a uh, reputation that people think the legislature has earned over the last couple of years is you don't like teachers, you don't like public education, therefore you're taking out your anger from the strike in 2018. I know you weren't there in 2018 or 16. You're taking out your anger from the two strikes on the teachers now. I would say that's completely false. I sit on the uh, education committee with a bunch of teachers that are uh, legislators. Um Everything that comes before us is either from the Department of Education, from the, um, the unions, or from the legislature. And we take each and every one of those bills up with the same uh, fervor as we do anything else. So um, I was proud to vote for teacher raises. I was pr proud to vote for school aid formula changes. Um, we are doing everything we can in our power to improve the environment of our education. If we, if we think right now it, we just need to throw money at a problem and it because we do have a problem in West Virginia and, and that's the bottom line so we got to try something new that's my opinion Jason you were around for the strikes I was yes both of them um, you know and I, I would point out that you know there was a twenty three hundred dollar pay raise this year which was meant to you know to be able to offset PEIA increases and I think that that largely does that you know there there are a few examples where someone uh, whose spouse will now be um, uh, have to pay the additional $147. So if you take the 24.9% increase to the PEIA premium plus the 149, th then that employee de depends on which one of the 10 tiers they're in, 
um, they could um, lose a little bit of money based on that $2,300 a year raise. But I think when you factor in their tax reductions, either through personal income tax or through their the, the rebate of their automobile tax, there's still money ahead. And you know, and I know that there were a lot of public employees, um, you know, many of which were teachers that reach out, um, you know, talking about PEIA. Um, and, and actually, I did have uh, a couple of uh, state employees who are not teachers reach out and, and ask for a fix of PEIA. Um, and I've always followed that up with, well, how do what what does that mean? What does fixing PEIA mean? We have got it back on track now, where it is an 80-20 split, which is what the code says it's supposed to be. The employer pays 80, which is the state. The employee pays 20 percent. We've gotten this. We were in this position where it's really 83% paid by the employer and 17% paid by the employee, and that number is going to continue would continue to grow uh, if we didn't um, come up with this solution. And that largely is because the governor has uh, instructed the PEIA board uh, and giving money uh, through the through the uh, PEIA reserve fund to be able to offset premium increases. So then, what happens? You know, every year that's a little bit of money that uh, the premium should be going up two, three percent, four, whatever it is, and we haven't done that for five or six, ten years, uh, and now it's compounded, and now you have to fix it, and now it's a twenty-four point nine percent increase because we didn't make the small incremental adjustments that we should have been making. And that uh, that board is now fiduciary bound to to that, right, Jason? So mm -hmm. they have to do they have to do the right thing now. So uh, we're not going to have these issues in the future. Yeah, we th this legislation does also free yeah. their hands up to make the right decisions. Yeah, um, where the governor just can't come in and say, "I want to throw another hundred million dollars in the PIA reserve fund," and the PIA finance board's hands are tied from making premium changes. Should the teachers, the state workers, everybody who's on PEIA? expect an annual adjustment to the premium to keep it at the 80-20 mix from this point forward and as a result of the premium adjustments expect a raise every year as well well i think that you look at whatever the the medical cost increase is and and i would expect some small change uh to that maybe annually maybe every other year um, it, it just depends on what uh, the, the finances of PIA are at the time. Now, you know, PIA hasn't been raised uh, in my recollection since 2012, which is 11 or 12 years at this point, 12 fiscal years at this point. Um, there isn't a health plan out there that anyone has through their employer or, or through the private sector that hasn't had a premium increase in 12 years. And, you know, should we continue to do raises? Absolutely. Um, but I would expect small increases to PIA in the foreseeable future, just the way that everyone is seeing uh, insurance. Premium Bill, hold that to just a second, because I'm, I'm going to take the halftime break. I'll come back with you. I just want to get Mike's comments before we go into the break. Yeah, I think if you look um, since the Affordable Care Act, everybody's uh, rates have gone up incrementally. Um, I, I wouldn't expect to see them go up. What we should be talking about is how we fix health care in general and, and insurance in general. Um, so those are the things that we can address in the future. I don't think you're going to see major jumps or bumps in it, in, in my opinion. Well, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, picking up on PA again, Jason, Mike, mm -hmm. uh, most insurance policies pay out based upon risk of service provided. PA does the other other way that uh, provides uh, – it. It's charges on income. Uh, is that something that should be changed? I think it's something that certainly needs looked at um, because, you know, like you said, if you have, um, you know, currently there are 10 different tiers in the PIA system, uh, and, and those are salary ranges uh, in each one of those tiers, and your, uh, your premium is based on that salary range. Um, one of the things that, that hasn't been changed that, if we stick with the um, salary, uh, w the way that in which we, we charge a premium based on salary, not a risk based or based on your health, your your age or your health, which is what every other insurance policy does, and I think there's a case to be made for that. But one of the things that we didn't change as it relates to spouses, if, uh, for example, uh, the spouse um, is does not have health care offered at their employee. Let's say they're let's say they're in their own business. And they make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, but insurance isn't offered at their small business. They can still stay on the PEIA plan, and their income, so the spousal income, is not factored in mm. 
to what the employee rate is. But if you have two state employees married to one another, it, it is. is. There is a penalty mm -hmm. uh, because they're, they're factoring in both salaries. So, you know, I know there are folks that are upset about spouses having to pay the $147 additional, um, but that's only if insurance is offered at your employer, which is what a lot of employers um, kind of have the same policy uh, when they're going to allow uh, spouses on their plan. So, you know, I think we were trying to get this more in line with um, what is a, kind of an industry standard. But to your point, Bill, the one thing, one of the things that we, we weren't able to address in that short amount of time that I think we need to look at is, is how do we set premiums? Should it be done based on the salary or should it be done based on, on risk or health or yeah. all those factors? Yeah. Can we change subjects, uh, Rob? Okay. Another one was corrections. And uh, if there was a, uh, if something was not addressed in this session, I believe it could be under the, the salaries for correction officers. I know the House did something and, or the Senate did something, the House rejected. Uh, is there going to be a special session uh, to, uh, to look specifically at the salaries for the correction officials? Well, I, I think the governor has indicated that's what he wants yeah. to do. Uh, I, I think it would make sense for us to have um, an agreement in place or, or something very close to an agreement in place uh, before we go into special session um, because we don't want to be down there and the, the taxpayers don't want us down there for weeks and a month, uh, you know, to at cost to the to the taxpayer without some type of agreement. So, you, you know, it, it's something that's incredibly important. Uh, I had uh, Senate Bill 464, which provided locality pay. Uh, for corrections, um, which uh, because we passed the other locality pay, we didn't do this one. So, you know, I, if if the state can afford it, um, you know, and it, it, it can work in our budget, then I think that we should absolutely do pay raises for correction workers. Um, I still think that there should be some flexibility uh, with the Department of Homeland Security to make uh, to give them flexibility to to give um, some additional salary increases in those facilities, in those areas where it's even harder to attract and retain employees. Yeah, it's everybody's describing this as uh, crisis at this stage, and I think the turnover would justify the, the description is crisis. Uh, something like $40 million a year is being paid for overtime uh, for correctional officers and also the National Guard and the like. So you have a, a, a starting point of at least $40 million that can go toward a million meaningful price increase, well, I, I, salary I increase. I don't know that I would say that the whole 40 million, because even if you had regular employees and the regular time employees in there, they're going to eat into some of that 40 yeah, million. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's some money. I think your point's well taken that yeah. there is, there is a, a portion of that money um, that would, could be used to, to give salary enhancements. Yeah. And what was the objection of the house on this, Mike? I, I don't think there was a bill that, that came out. I know there was the, um, the, the locality, locality pay bill, but the in the House, the, the, the reasons I got is correction officers are not state employees. They're not, they, we can't just write a bill for them. That needs to come from the governor is what I've been told. Um, I do know that the uh, National Guard, 82% of their salaries are paid by the federal government, so through federal subsidies. So uh, there is a reason, I think, and I, again, uh, way over my pay grade, I'm just kind of getting into it, but I'm starting to see behind the, the shield a little bit here. There is a reason that it was kicked down the road a little bit, and I do think, like Jason said, I think the governor does want to bring us back into session and try and figure out something like that. Um, I just haven't seen specifics. Yeah, and I and, and I don't think they have been specifics yeah. yet. But the governor is one that declared a state of emergency, and, and uh, that and was we a, had to declare the state yeah. of emergency in order to keep the federal funding coming. So you, you got to look kind of look at that when you think about 82 percent of their salaries are being paid by the federal government i think it's a lot more than 30 million now bill i think it, it's a it, bigger piece of the it pie. may well be yeah. i i had 40 million that i yeah. read yeah because there was a uh, uh one of the bills would have a, a ten thousand dollar increase as well as hiring and retention bonuses uh, and i did not uh, see any uh bill that came across yeah. um any of the committees and, and the ten thousand dollars is what we did for state troopers, state troopers last yeah. year at 600 and at the time 641 troopers uh at ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars as opposed to and that that's only the salary that doesn't include um 
Well, that no, that doesn't include uh, what that puts on our pension uh, yeah. because there's a pension yeah. obligation that goes mm -hmm. along with that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So it's it's it, it's more than just the the ten thousand uh, dollars. But well, there there's are, at least one less person on that pension obligation now. Well, there, I, I think there are a couple less, yeah. but uh, yeah. there might be a couple more. So. Yeah. Uh, kind of extend this a little bit more. Uh, Corrections uh, salaries is definitely important. Uh, is anything else that was not addressed in the uh, in last session that would equate to the same level of concern as the correction officers? Yeah, for me, I, I think there was there was a bill that came across that I was extremely interested in, and that was the unemployment um, right now in West Virginia. And Jason could speak a little more to this because he knows about this bill. But a bill came across to the House that I was super excited to see. It, it took unemployment from 26 weeks down to, and I'll let Jason talk about it, but it was a formula based on your unemployment in your county, um, and, and it took it down, it could take it down all the way to 12 weeks. And, and when, you, when we look at the state of, our, our, of West Virginia and 55% of our workforce is not working, we need to get people back to work. And, and I know I've talked with the labor guys. And I've talked with the guys down south. I know they like to take the winter off because, you know, it's it's nice and you can keep your benefits if you if you're in a, in a labor job. But a guy that's working the pipeline and making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and then goes on eighteen sixteen to eighteen weeks of unemployment every single year, I don't think that's what it was meant for. Um, and I had people call me and say, you know, we really like to take the winter off. I'm like, well, that's great, but. Um, so it, that confused the house, I think, uh, a lot of the folks. Um, and it was one of those things where we were really trying to work that to the end, but we never got there. And Jason can speak about the formula a little bit. Um, yeah, and the formula is actually based on the statewide unemployment rate. The, the members of the house wanted to do that based on the county, but there are federal laws that don't allow us to do that. So uh, currently, you can receive up to 26 weeks of unemployment compensation. Uh, what this bill did was it indexed uh, the the term in which you can receive the unemployment benefit from anywhere from 12 weeks to 20 weeks. Obviously, the lower that the state unemployment rate is, you know, at the lowest rate you'd be at 12 weeks. If it were at the highest uh, rate in this uh, index, then you could get up to 20 weeks, and so that it would just <clears throat> kind of fluctuate between 12 and 20 based on the state's unemployment rate. There are other states that that are doing this. Um, and I think to Mike's point about folks that, um, you know, are, you know, I want to say abusing the system. I think they're using the system for, for purposes in, in which it is not intended. And I don't think it's intended to take three months off to go to Myrtle Beach or go hunt and fish and whatever it is you want to do uh, and collect unemployment. Now, to the 26 weeks, did that predate COVID? Yes. Okay, so that was in place prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and that's what I just get crazy as the person that signs a check six months is absolutely ridiculous um especially when you've got billboards especially for us in berkeley county i mean you've got billboards offering signing bonuses yeah. that if you don't have a job here in berkeley county there is something wrong but in other parts of the state where some of those pipeline jobs or mining jobs are there might not be as many there jobs might not be and i think that's where the happy medium comes is, is you, you need to look at those on a, and i thought the 16 to 18 week hard cut and, and take the formula out just so that members of the house could understand it um and i hate to say it like that but you know the, the, there was confusion um amongst a lot of the ranks um so something a lot simpler would be better for west virginia the the index is intuitively attractive to me but would the index fall on the same problems that locality pay does would there be certain sections of the state said I'm well and i think that's i think it's a good point yeah. i think that's some of the opposition uh in the senate we were willing to compromise on that we were willing to to go to a a, a specific uh, week whether it's 16 or 18 we were willing to say okay let's not use the state's average let's use the the highest unemployment rate in any county or or an average of the the highest five i mean so we we were willing to compromise i think on on how the indexing was w was calculated uh, and if we wanted to use um, it, it based on you know five of the the highest uh, unemployment counties we could do that you just can't treat people in one county differently than you yeah. treat them in another and I, when it came down to it bill it was we were negotiating uh, i'm not even on workforce but I, I got myself involved in this for some reason um but we were negotiating it, it, 
all avenues. And I just, it's something we're going to have to work on throughout the, um, the, the, this year until next session. It's not a conversation. It's kind of like, you know, DHHR, these big things that were passed, they weren't just passed this session. They, mm-hmm. were, they were passed over the last year. I think this is one that I'd like to see passed some, sometime next year. Maria. So um, because it's not 956, um, but it's 946, each of you, um, what was the biggest win? Um, and you can have the same one, or you can have a different one, or you can have one that didn't cross the finish line that you were personally, of course, that wouldn't be a win then, would it? Right. But would you, anyway. would you eliminate tax? Because tax credit, that's what everybody yeah. says. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and not, not tax credits. Okay. The, you know, the, the biggest win, um, and I felt myself um, really rooting for this bill was the teacher's aid bill, and, and the, it, it, the way it was crafted, the way it was, it went from, the speaker's bill that we had co-sponsored, that kind of got killed. And then we took the governor's bill um, and we hijacked that and pulled a Senate move and put a whole bill in there. Um, <laughs> it, it, the way it worked for me seeing that bill actually cross the finish line was my, uh, I think I really liked the way it worked and the way it And did, for so. listeners who may have been under a rock during this time, yeah. talk a little bit about what that bill does. So uh, that bill gives the ability for... There's for, some miscommunication on yeah, that too. It gives yeah. the ability for right. the counties to... It, one, it's $39 million um, to, to the schools, uh, but it gives the ability for a teacher's aide to be in first, second, or third grade. Or not. Not and all of them, but no, or. It, to start with, it's it's one grade, right? Uh, the Senate really wanted it to be first grade. The House really wanted it to be third grade. There's flexibility in there now to let the schools or the county boards decide where they're going to put these people and how they're going to use it. It it is a uh, it's for for really for uh, reading and, and getting people to to that third grade level of reading, which is where we are suffering in West Virginia. Uh, it also has some um, uh, dyslexia, and I, I forget the other word. Dyscalculia. Dyscalculia. Thank you, Jason. Uh, has some uh, things in there to help with those, um, those that testing and helping those kids. Um, all in all, and it, it had a Grow Your Own program in there, but we kind of took that out. Um, all in all, it's a great bill a great piece of legislation i think will really help early reading in in west virginia and we we have some real issues maybe not here in berkeley county but we have some real issues across the state jason well i I think mike i'll pick a different one but but just to comment on on the one that mike chose and i think he's right i think that is um the the most impactful and and when you look at all the studies that show that uh, if kids don't read at the third grade level the success rate moving forward uh, suffers tremendously. So getting children able to read at grade level by the third grade is I- incredibly important in their academic future. So this bill goes a long way in, in doing that. Uh, but I'll, I'll choose a different one, and that is uh, the DHHR reorganization. Um, I, I think that you, you will see so many efficiencies within those three departments. I think that the legislature has sent a clear message to the governor's office, to uh, the, the new three agencies that that um, we're putting you under a microscope. We're going to ensure that, that money is spent properly and it gets to the places that it's supposed to and that we help um, uh, the, the people that it's intended to help. Uh, and, and we're just not going to grow bureaucracy and spend money for the sake of spending money. And, and the, the budgets that you will see uh, from those three agencies now will be far more in detail than they ever have been so that legislators and anyone else that wants to read uh, the state's general revenue budget um, can understand, can have a better understanding as to where uh, money is being spent um, through DHHR. Uh, Jason, on that, uh, the success will depend in large part upon the leadership of these three three different units. Uh, and uh, Roger Henshaw was on Monday, and he he mentioned what you just said. There's going to be some review, some oversight provided. Uh, but the uh, uh, and I lost my question. It's a, something with the three. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. Back to Maria. Back to Maria. Now, While I, it's a, now, it, a, a, now you a, threw me off. A, now a, 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 I'll add a bill. That, yeah. the, you know, the, a bill that I was really impressed with was an 84-page bill that Charlie Trump wrote that came over from the Senate. And my, my buddy next to me, Tom Fast, called it the biggest booze bill he's ever seen. And <laughs> it is, quite honestly, one of the best bills for Berkeley, Jefferson, Morgan County that, that you, we will encounter because it does – 
open up a lot of our archaic ABC rules. Okay. Um, and it gives municipalities, uh, you know, the ability to have festivals with alcohol. It gives uh, brewers the ability to have second manufacturing locations. That bill was extre- like it was extremely long, but when you went through it, and the more you read of it, the more I realized Charlie Trump is a genius, <laughs> and, and that was a really so, good one. So and yet his alarm are- clock doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, thanks for bailing me out a second there, Rob. Uh, my question was... Uh, Did you the- get Trump, Maria? <laughs> I, I can't even... I- one question in, 15, in 20 go, let, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So what was the biggest disappointment then? So, uh, In my opinion, the biggest disappointment was us not getting well, Rob's bill through. But uh, besides that, probably the EMS and fire um, bill that just didn't make it to the finish line in the end. That was the biggest disappointment. Okay. Um, uh, that is a big one, and I think that we're, you know, I, I've been in talks um, with our Senate Finance Chairman, with some members of the House, to, to, if we go into special session, to try to get that one right. It provides more funding to uh, local fire and EMS volunteer uh uh, volunteer fire departments and EMS. Uh, the one for me is is obviously the locality pay bill that that is inaccurately being called a study. Um, that uh, you looked re- at me when you said that. I did. He shifted his eyes. He didn't really look. Uh, which required uh, every agency to develop a plan. Um, it wasn't to study what they could do. It was so they're they're going to develop. They would they would have developed a plan, uh, and the the legislature would have then. Uh, giving them the authority to implement that plan um, the, in in the future uh, and provide funding if necessary to be able to do know, that. We know what the the results of that study would be, right, Jason? Well, it's not I, a study. We've already it, yeah. we've studied it. it, well, it well, the, we already know the plan. Ooh, he's poking the um, bear. So, and, and the pushback is. We already know what we have to do. We just don't have the votes to get there. Well, and I, but I think that each agency is probably going to come at it at a, at a different way. I gotcha. mean, th- there are certain agencies that that have uh, th- that may want to have the flexibility for up to five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, or or maybe they see that it's not uh, hard to get employees uh, in the Eastern Panhandle. Maybe they see it's it's harder to get employees somewhere else. So this just allowed the flexibility for every agency to develop what worked for them. Uh, and, and not just have a one-size-fits-all locality uh, pay plan that we couldn't get passed out of the legislature anyway. Right. I really think that the, the, the plan that the House tried to pass with the five counties, if that bill doesn't run uh, and doesn't die on the floor the way that it did, I think the other one had a much better shot at um, at passing. But, but yeah, when, you limit it, the other. when you limit it to three to five counties, yeah. um, you don't have to, you know, yeah, they, you don't they, have to be a rocket scientist to yeah, figure you, out they're not getting the votes even for that. In, even in caucus, we you know, we were getting lambasted on that one. Just you know, run it or kill it. And that was their attitude. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you you don't usually get a lot of that unless they know they've got the votes. And we we were six short. Billy, a quick question. Uh, going back to these uh, DHHR, the three units, are they going? Is the leadership going to be cabinet level positions? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, so they're going to be term limit, basically, for the tenure of the uh, of the governor. Are they going, to, or can they be? Uh, well, the, the the new governor can keep anybody in place that he wants, but, or but, she wants. But they, but after the with the new governor, uh, then they're going to be subject to renewal or or. Yeah, I don't know that, that they. This is my first year in the Senate, so yeah. I, I'm not sure. You know, the Senate does confirmations, and I think if the person's already in place, I don't know that they have to be reconfirmed. Uh, but but all of those positions are. You know, the governor can ask for the resignation or, or fire them, cabinet level positions at any time. And that's uh, all positions, right? Jim? Yeah, because you and I have had this discussion before, Jason, and I can see some merit in uh, in dividing the three units i also feel that everything comes back to leadership and you've got to have folks the ad, the appropriate leader uh to fulfill there so uh that's yeah and I, I think to your point if if we were able to get three really good cabinet secretaries into these positions um i don't think that this the a new governor would want to say you know what i really want to go out and do find three more people to do these yeah. jobs yeah. Uh, so i think if there are are people in there that 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 are doing the job we expected them to do are doing a good job you know i would anticipate the new governor just you know wanting to keep them on unless they had somebody yeah. better but that again has to go through confirmation yeah. through the senate but for many positions this is exactly what happens at the change of administration you bring new people in 
Yeah, I mean, some of those cabinet secretaries have been there for, for some time, but you're right. I mean, especially when it switches parties, you, you'll see yeah. a bigger from, yeah. from you you're know, right. if you have a you're Democrat right. governor yeah. to a Republican governor, you'll see bigger changes then. Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, I, for example, it's not a cabinet level position, but you look at the lottery director or the ABC yeah. commissioner. Yeah. I don't I don't know that a new governor is going to come in and say, I want to put Let's my person again. in there. Yeah. Right. Jason, in the, in, the, in the Senate, was there as much fight against the Economic Development Authority as you saw it in the House? Like, no. there, there's a large portion of the House that se just seems to have a we, we have Mitch. We have far less conspiracy theorists in the okay. Senate than That's you do right. in the House. Okay. How about the police superintendent? <laughs> The one that was the police, the, the uh, state yeah. superintendent, yeah, state uh, superintendent. Uh, Colonel Cahill, and that you know about twenty seconds on that. Um, you know that started some of those stories and rumors started to break towards sure. the end of session. Um, we we didn't really have too many discussions about that, but but I anticipate an investigation to be ongoing. This segment of the show.